The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. In July 2015, the Obama administration, along with Germany, Great Britain, China, Russia, and France, reached a deal with Tehran that reduces economic sanctions on Iran in exchange for that nation ending its pursuit of nuclear weapons. After a lively 60-day review period, congressional opponents were unable to muster the votes to scuttle the agreement. But as the 2016 presidential campaign heats up, it seems the debate is far from over. Republican candidates and other critics say the deal gives away too much. Supporters, including Democratic hopefuls Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, say the alternative would be much more dangerous. Today, we'll look at where we stand with regard to implementing the deal and how it's already altering the political and strategic landscape, both here and abroad. We're joined by Joseph Serencioni, who, for over three decades, has been among the world's most prominent nuclear weapons policy experts. In addition to serving as a member of Secretary of State John Kerry's International Security Advisory Board, he's president of Plowshares Fund, a global security foundation focused on nuclear weapons policy and conflict resolution. He's also author of numerous books dealing with policies around weapons of mass destruction, including most recently, Nuclear Nightmares, Securing the World Before It's Too Late by Columbia University Press. Well, Joe, welcome back to International it's a Focus. Pleasure. Thank you very much for having me back. Well, uh, First of all, let's, let's sort of sketch out the parameters. What was agreed to in July? Who has to do what and when? So this multinational agreement basically shrink wraps Iran's nuclear program. It shrinks it down to a fraction of its current size and then wraps it in an inspection regime that's tougher than anything we ever negotiated. The deal actually had to go through some legislative hurdles. Was the U.S. Congress going to stop it? Would the Iranian parliament stop it? Nobody did stop it. So in mid-October, it formally entered into force. It's now been adopted. Over the next few months, you're going to see Iran start to dismantle its infrastructure that it spent the last 10, 15 years and billions of dollars building up. It's going to rip out two-thirds of its centrifuges. Those are the machines that could be used to enrich uranium for fuel or for bombs. It's going to ship all its stockpile of uranium gas out of the country, except for a token amount. And it's going to rip out the core of its plutonium-producing reactor drill it full of holes and fill it with concrete. This effectively blocks all the ways that Iran could make a bomb. And then it's going to implement an inspection regime with inspectors and seals and cameras and monitors so that we can try to catch them if they should cheat. If and when they do that, the Iranians think they might be able to do it by the end of the year. U.S. experts think it'll take a little longer. At that point, then most of the U.S. sanctions are suspended, the European sanctions are suspended, and Iran is open for business. So the deal seemed to be a lot less controversial in other parts of the world. In, uh, in the U.S. political environment, it became much more of a political football, I think. Perhaps it had less about security and the implications for nonproliferation and more just because. Uh, uh, that, it, that is really true. In, in our, our closest European allies. The conservative governments of the United Kingdom and France and Germany negotiated this agreement with us, and this was non-controversial in those countries. I mean, these are not softies. The French are very tough on Iran. They agreed to this agreement. They thought this was the best way to stop Iran from getting a bomb. Most other countries in the world agreed, even some of our Sunni Arab allies in the region, Saudi Arabia, was fiercely opposed to Iran, agreed with this agreement. It became a political football here in the United States with President Obama's Republican opponents using it to attack him for being weak or, or dangerous or naive or selling out. They tried to use it as a wedge issue, particularly with Jewish American voters, to try to split them off from the Democratic Party. And then when Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu jumped in feet first into this debate, that really made this whole discussion uh, acidic, allied the 
government of Israel with the Republican Party here, and that's why we had such a fierce debate over the last year over this agreement. It's not because of the merits, it's because of the politics. Well, and a debate that doesn't look like it's ending anytime soon in this presidential cycle. We've got a couple of uh, slides we can take a quick look at. First, the, uh, the two Democratic frontrunners on the deal, Hillary Clinton saying, is the deal perfect? Of course not. No agreement like this ever is. But it's a, is that a strong agreement? Yes, it is. Bernie Sanders, I'm not going to tell you that this is a perfect agreement. But the alternative of not reaching an agreement, you know what that is? It's war. Okay, now let's go across the aisle and see what the Republican frontrunners, Jeb Bush, dangerous, deeply flawed, and short-sighted. Ben Carson puts the whole country in jeopardy, and Mr. Trump saying only very stupid people are in favor of it. Well, that is a very stupid thing to say. <laughs> I mean, this has been endorsed by uh, former secretaries of state, former secretaries of defense, Republicans and Democrats, Colin Powell, Richard Lugar, Paul Volcker. Uh, I don't believe these people are stupid. I don't believe the former head of the Strategic Command are stupid people. There was a letter sent by 30 top scientists, nuclear experts, people who help build bombs, including seven Nobel laureates, hardly stupid people, embracing the agreement, praising its innovative inspection techniques. In the larger national security establishment in the United States, this was really a no-brainer. There was very little debate among nuclear policy experts. All of them were in favor of this agreement. It was the politics that complicated this, not the policy. Well, we're going to hear, uh, I would guess, in the coming months, throughout the campaign, sort of the, the standard critique. So mm. let's run through some of these and, uh, and get your response. One of the things you hear is it increases the odds of Iran ultimately acquiring nuclear weapons because it's just not an effective deal. Many people would have preferred to eliminate the entire nuclear weapons complex. In fact, that was my position 10 years ago when they just had a few dozen machines. But now they had 20,000 machines. They had dozens of sites. You were never going to get a politician in Iran to agree to scrap the whole thing. We're not Rome. They're not Carthage. There was no salting of the earth here. So you have a limited program. And that is the the, the essence of the controversy. Once there is something there, there is always the possibility that it could grow in future years. So as Iran implements this agreement, some of the restrictions come off in 10 years, but most remain. A few more come off in 15. Some come off in 20 years. So there is the possibility that 20, 25 years hence, Iran could restart this program and have a nuclear capability. But this deal delays that for at least a generation. An entire generation of Iranians are going to grow up without this program, without this capability. Iran's going to be much more integrated into the rest of the world. And this is how nonproliferation works everywhere. You take these outlier countries, you have them agree to put aside their program, you integrate them into the international system, and in almost every case that has worked. That's the hope here with Iran. What about the regional impact? People say, well, you know, you, you've made a lot of their neighbors very nervous. Won't this provoke a, an arms race of some sort? Well, this definitely, I, I think there's very little disagreement. For the next 20 years, this blocks Iran from getting a bomb. The controversy is really what happens after. But in those 20 years, the region is safer. Israel safer, Saudi Arabia is safer. You have stopped a nuclear arms race in the region. But here's the part that really is underlying this. You are shifting the geopolitical balance by starting to bring Iran back into the international system, by having it open up for business, by having this new relationship with Iran, you are raising the potential that Iran could become a more important player in the region, could become more important to us. So naturally, our existing allies, Saudi Arabia and Israel, are fearful of that. They think if Iran's influence grows, theirs might lessen. That is really the underlying politics that's, that's motivating this whole discussion. In some ways, the nuclear weapons proposal is just the thing we're talking about. It's the dynamic that's making everybody nervous. And what about the, the financial impact of easing the sanctions. You know, you hear a lot about this windfall that Tehran will suddenly have to invest in all sorts of mischief around the world. Well, the sanctions were put in place under Republicans and Democrats. You got to give President Bush credit for starting this process, but it's really Obama 
that because he was willing to negotiate, got the other nations of the world to agree. And once you had China not buying oil, South Korea not buying oil or buying less, you really cut Iran's exports of oil in half. They went from about 2 million barrels a day to 1 million. That meant their economy tanked, their currency tanked, inflation took off, unemployment took off. That's what brought Iran back to the table. So the deal is they take apart the things that are worrying us, most of their nuclear complex, and we will put take off the things that are worrying them, the sanctions. Now, that means you're going to have more money flowing into the government of Iran. Will they use some of that to support Hezbollah and Hamas? Maybe, but it's not going to be significant. Even during these sanctions, they were bankrolling Hamas and Hezbollah. That stayed. That was always a constant. And the, 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 the hope is that this deal not only solves the nuclear issue, but opens the way for other conversations to Iran that can get them to moderate their behavior. This is what Henry Kissinger says. If Iran is willing to moderate its behavior, we should be open to a dialogue with Iran, because Iran can be critical in helping to prevent the further collapse of the Middle East. Well, and finally, just at a, a more basic level, people are saying U.S. is embracing and accommodating what, what has uh, historically yeah. been a bad actor, and why are we rewarding these people? Well, th this is an ongoing debate in U.S. policy circles, and there are groups of experts, uh, the neoconservatives m most famously, um, who, whose view of how the U.S. should behave in the world is that we should be leading with our military power. What's the point of being a superpower if you can't kick a little butt? And so this was the idea behind the Iraq war. We were going to fix the Middle East by overthrowing the tyrants. Saddam Hussein was just the first one. Well, you saw how that worked. It's been a disaster. Many of the problems we have in the Middle East stem from that historic blunder. Uh, and, and even Donald Trump makes this point. Should we have overthrown Hussein? Should Saddam Hussein? Should we have uh, really toppled uh, uh, Gaddafi, do you really want Assad to go? There are worse things than having a dictator in control of a country. But that view is over in one camp, and you see the Republican Party candidates e echoing that view. The point really isn't the nuclear program. The point is to force a regime change. On the Democratic side, you have a dif difference of opinion about how to proceed. But most of the Democrats basically want some kind of engagement, some kind of method of changing the regime's behavior, not changing the regime. Well, we've got uh, just about a minute before we take a short break, but talk a little bit about how this coalition that, that had put the sanctions in place and really held together quite cohesively would likely have fared had we not ratified this well, deal. Well, this is actually the decisive argument. You, the, the, I think this is a very good deal, and that was the main selling point. But the other main selling point was, what's the alternative? There wasn't a better deal to be had. One of the most important meetings that members of the Senate had was when Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois brought in his Democratic colleagues to meet with the ambassadors of all of our partner countries, so the Europeans plus Russia and, and China. And they told the senators that if the U.S. walks away from this deal, they're walking away alone. No other country was going to go back and renegotiate. And why would Iran renegotiate? If we're going to break one deal that was we reached, what confidence could they have that we'd keep another one? So there really was no uh, viable alternative, which is why people felt if you break this, if you reject this deal, you're putting us on a confrontational path with Iran that would likely lead to another war in the Middle East. Well, and uh, not insignificantly, uh, one of the things that has made military adventures in, in the region, at least from a military standpoint, more successful is the fact that you could assemble a coalition. Yes. That would be unlikely in that scenario, wouldn't it? So, so even if you're hawkish on Iran, you could make the case that walking away from the deal somehow compromises the U.S.'s military ability. And people do make this case. In fact, former Senator Carl Levin wrote an article about this, that if, that if you think you want to go to, the, to war with Iran, you should be in favor of this deal, because it's the only way you're going to convince other countries that military action is necessary. Nobody else is with us on this. 
You know, it was the U.S. and Israel were the only ones talking about real military action, and maybe the Saudis sort of encouraging us from the sideline, although they wouldn't actually do anything. But if you make this deal and Iran breaks it, well, now they've broken a solemn agreement. Now, not only would UN sanctions come back to cripple the economy, but the, the possibility of the use of military force would be very much in the center of the table. So we'll talk about sort of what comes next uh, after a short break. But first, we'll take a break and come right back. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back. We're discussing the Iran nuclear agreement with Joe Serencioni from the Plowshares Fund. Well, on the U.S. side, really, I, I think there are some discernible camps with regard to response to the deal. Uh, there, as you alluded to, there are people who are just flat out opposed to it, and the only viable approach to Iran is regime change. But within those who are uh, favorable, I think there, there's a... a gradation of opinion from, okay, as a security deal, yeah. this is okay. And, and so we will do basically containment and yeah. it begins and ends there. So uh, Hillary Clinton, now running for the presidency, gave a speech at the Brookings Institution uh, several weeks ago. I was there and I heard the speech and she embraces the agreement. She says this is a, a, a substantial gain for U.S. national security, but that's as far as she's willing to go. She then says, well, let's look forward, and she details a policy that basically seeks to contain Iran, to keep it in a box, not to allow it to expand its influence in any way. And, and that policy, I'm afraid, is one that would squander the opportunities that this deal presents. It's not the view of the President of the United States, Barack Obama. Uh, at the United Nations, just a few days after Secretary Clinton spoke, he talked about this deal as, as not just a national security benefit, but a gateway issue of opening the possibility of further discussions with Iran. So if, if Hillary wants containment with some engagement, the president wants engagement with some containment, that we're going to continue to resist any adventurous activities, for example, in Yemen or with Hezbollah and Hamas, but we want to try to engage Iran to make them uh, a responsible player in the region. This actually is what is now represented by the so-called realist school of great power politics. Brent Scowcroft, uh, Henry Kissinger, for example, uh, talking about the need to involve Iran in the regional solutions. Having them at the table is no guarantee you can find a solution, but you're never going to find a solution if they're not at the table. Well, talk a little bit about that. I mean, where is there an alignment between U.S. interests in the region and Iran? I think whenever you have to look at these issues, you don't look for goodwill or uh, trust. You're looking at where do you have overlapping strategic objectives? Where, where do the interests of the United States and Iran and our regional allies overlap? And you can see that we both have an overlapping interest in ending the warfare in Syria. Iran would like to preserve Assad's rule. We would like to stop the killing and transform the Assad regime, but we have an interest right now in working to stop the war. We both have an interest in fighting ISIS, a sworn enemy of the Iranian regime, a Sunni group against the Iranian Shia regime. So do we. We have an interest in stabilizing Iraq, in stabilizing Afghanistan. It's in these areas where you could start to see some cooperation. I also might include ending the conflict in Yemen. So many of the conflicts you see here have not just a U.S. involvement, but an Iranian involvement. If you're going to have a solution, you've got to involve Iran in the, in the discussion. Well, we've talked a lot about uh, the varying opinions and enthusiasm for the deal on uh, the U.S. side. I'd like to read you two quotes now from uh, within Iran. First of all, uh, President Hassan Rouhani, who, of course, is a proponent of the deal, who says... Through the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, 
We're not solely seeking a nuclear deal. We want to suggest a new and constructive way to recreate the international order. So this gateway yeah. notion. Uh, and that was in September of 2015. At about the same time, the Supreme Leader Khamenei said, we negotiated with the U.S. on the nuclear issue for specific reasons. The Americans behaved well in the talks, but we didn't and we won't allow negotiations with the Americans on other issues. Right. So right. it somewhat mirrors uh, yeah. the, the American reality. So this is so interesting because... You know, everybody's familiar with the politics we have here. I mean, you can't escape it. It's, this is what the news basically covers. But we don't think about the politics in Iran. But it is an intensely political uh, country. I, I would, you couldn't call it a democracy, but there are elections. There are competing factions. Rouhani, for example, won in a surprise victory in June of 2013. He was one of seven candidates running. The other six were all regime chosen. He was the outsider. He gets more than 50 percent of the vote. He wasn't supposed to be the guy. He wasn't the supreme leader's pick, but he gets elected. There's, that's why there's elements of democracy here. So what's going on now? There are hardliners in Iran who are dead set against this agreement. They, they don't want this agreement to take a place. They don't want to be closer to the United States. They don't want to stop the so-called revolutionary activities. The reason you saw so many young people celebrating in the streets of Tehran when this deal was announced, not because they think it's a victory over the great Satan, because they think it's an opening to us. They think it's a way for them to get what we have. They're, Iran, anybody who's been to Iran knows it's one of the most pro-American populations in the Middle East. Once they find out you're American, they can't get enough of you. And so they want to get closer. They want to open up their society. They think this is the beginning. That's exactly why the hardliners are against it. They don't want to open up. They don't want any pressure for domestic reforms, etc. So there's this contest going on, and it will play out over statements from the Supreme Leader who has to okay the agreement, which he just did, but reassure the right wing that he's not giving up, that he's the baddest guy in town and you can trust him. It'll play out in elections next year. There's a parliamentary elections in Iran in February. Then there's elections for what they call the Council of Experts, the group that chooses the Supreme Leader. And then in 2017, Rouhani himself is up for re-election. So there's going to be intense political debate in Iran at the same time you're seeing it here in the United States. Well, you know, it's a region with very long memories, of course. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about the context of all of this. I mean, where do you think Iran sees itself in the world and, and in the region? I mean, I think similarly to China, yeah. where, where when they weren't as prominent, they felt that was a, a historical anomaly. Like, this, we have a, a certain historical and natural place in the world, and we're just getting back to that. How does this play into that? Hmm. It's true what you say about China. One way to look at world history is that it's mostly been about China with the group of barbarians around its periphery going through motions. And, and China sees itself as a, a, a naturally as a great power. Iran sees itself the same way. This is one of the world's great civilizations. It's not a made up country. You know, the Persian Empire has been around for three millennia. So this is a, a proud and historic people. And they also it's not just the history. When you look at the potential of Iran, which is one of the things that excites businessmen, about business people, about coming in and doing business, uh, Iran in the next three decades or so could become one of the most powerful uh, economic countries in the world. They have a 80 million people, very well educated, highly literate. 60% of the population is, un is under 30. They have an industrial base. They're the only country in the Middle East that makes makes cars. They're sitting on a fifth of the world's oil reserves, a quarter of the world's natural gas reserves. I mean, this could become a real powerhouse, and I think that's what Rouhani represents. President Rouhani is the pragmatic wing of the Iranian elite who want to re-engage with the world, who want to unleash Iran's economic potential. That's how they'll have power. That's how they'll protect the nation, not through the illusory power that, that nuclear weapons promise but never really deliver. So that's the kind of historic trend that we, that we could be, be witnessing. It's really one of the most dramatic put, uh, stories of the next two decades. So assuming uh, the, the dismantling and the drilling and the filling with concrete goes uh, on as it's scheduled to, what uh, should we, we be looking for in the months ahead that, that might suggest 
this truly is something more than a very narrowly confined security. Well, so first, let's see if they do it. Let's what uh, videos photos, reports from the region, are they really taking this stuff out? Then I'd be watching Secretary Kerry. Who is he talking to? How often is he going to the region? There, he's already having talks with the Russians and the Iranians over Syria. Let's see where that leads. That's probably the first big issue you might try to want to resolve. And if it works, well, then it, you could see the, the alliance, the cooperation. Alliance is too strong a word between Iran and the United States and other countries against ISIS. I'd be looking for that. And I'd also start to look at sort of the normalization of U.S.-Iranian um, relationships. We're a long way from reestablishing democratic relations. But remember, two years ago, the, a, a U.S. Secretary of State had never spoken to a foreign minister of the Islamic Republic. Now Kerry and, and Zarif are Facebook friends. You know, so the world is changing in front of our eyes. This relationship is changing in front of our eyes. It's an exciting development that uh, that is just getting started. Well, Joel Cerenzioni, thank you for joining us once again. My pleasure. Fascinating tale to watch, as always. Our viewers, we'll see you next time on International Focus. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website, 